actually it's a big honor to be a part of this uh, meeting and oration. Uh, I'm going to talk on a subject which you would have heard from a diabetologist or, a, or also from cardiologists. Generally, gastroenterologists don't talk about metabolic syndrome because uh, it was felt that it was diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, which are the most common problems with uh, metabolic syndrome. But in recent years, for the last five or six years, there's been a dramatic insight into the etiopathogenesis of this disorder. And we discovered that not only most of it resides in the gastrointestinal tract, the whole starting point is from the GI tract, and I explained to you how. And that's how, how gastroenterologists and hepatologists have now got uh, very involved with this disorder. In fact, uh, we seem to have come, uh, come to the dead end of our evolution uh, with the resultant metabolic disease, but we start, have had to de-evolve now to become, get rid of these problems. Of course, to audience like this, the definition of metabolic syndrome I wouldn't like to talk about, but the three most important concepts of uh, metabolic syndrome, the diabetes, obesity, and NFLD, are the three things that bother us as clinicians. We keep seeing these patients when they come to us, and these are the three pandemics affecting hundreds of millions of people, three chronic diseases poorly managed, all dramatically increasing prevalence. So any physician, I think it's very important to have a strong grip on this disease, and fortunately for us, we are now understanding how this is evolving. In fact, for the gastroenterologists, not only the metabolic syndrome is associated with uh, NAFLD, the gallstones, steatosis, uh, and then of course, GERD and so on, so a lot of problems. But the most important problem is liver related. In fact, NAFLD, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and metabolic syndrome are almost synonymous. Uh, you in, in uh, it starts with simple steatosis, goes into NASH, then fibrosis, advanced fibrosis, cirrhosis, and finally, a significant percentage of these patients turn up with uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. So the whole spectrum evolves along with this metabolic syndrome they have. So what is the gastroenterologist's view? Of course, we have some role in the pathogenesis, the affected organs are involved, and of course, increasingly, GI drugs and GI methodology are being used to treat this syndrome. Uh, I'll come a little later into the pathogenesis because we have some very, very interesting data and concepts of how metabolic syndrome occurs. The affected organs are, of course, uh, everything right from the esophagus to gallbladder to pancreas to colon and so on. In fact, marked increase in colonic cancers in these patients. And of course, in addition to the diet and exercise and drugs, we have important component which I'm going to spend 10 minutes on, which is metabolic endoscopy. How we can reverse the whole metabolism with endoscopy, very interesting concepts. So our role is now in managing this, but let me come first to how we understood now what happens in these patients. What happens is normally our concept as physicians has been that the whole metabolic process in the body is controlled by the pancreas, right? So we think pancreas secretes uh, insulin, pancreas secretes so many glucagon, so many other hormones, controlling whole metabolic syndrome. But this is wrong. This concept is wrong. In fact, the whole metabolic process is controlled by second, third, and fourth part of the duodenum. In fact, it's a nature's mechanism because when we eat food, the first organ that comes into contact with digested food is the duodenum. Right? So it's nat natural that the duodenum should be the head of the orchestra controlling the whole metabolic process. And this we have discovered now. Now what happens normally when you have food, the food passes, digested food passes through the duodenum. As it's passing through the duodenum, in the duodenum there are enteroendocrine cells, the so-called neuroendocrine system of the duodenum, which gets stimulated by the food. So this stimulation results in a variety of hormones those which are pro-insulin are called incretins, anti-incretins are called anti-incretins. So two sets of hormones. There are now a variety of these have been actually identified. I'll come to that a little later. But with this, the anti-incretins are now getting better identified because they become very important. The one of them is the insulin resistant factor and other one is the diabetic intestinal peptide. So this balance of incretins and anti-incretins results in euglycemia and eu metabolism, normal metabolism, right? Now, when we eat food which is containing highly refined products, now 
this is happening. Look at the sugar consumption in our country, market increasing. A variety of ways how we are actually tempted with this high refined sugar food. What happens then? This is what happens. You take this highly refined food, and as the food passes through, the anti-incretins increases. The reason why this happens in nature is that if you give refined sugars, it goes into the body, stimulates high amount of insulin, then you go into reactive hypoglycemia. To prevent that, body starts increasing the anti-incretins to try and balance. So what happens because of this? Because of this, insulin resistance develops. The whole central concept of metabolic syndrome is insulin resistance. This insulin resistance not only gives rise to increased blood sugar, TGL, NASH, and so on, the whole system now goes into a different gear. And this insulin resistance is responsible for rest of the things that happen. So you see there's a fine balance between uh, incretins, uh, so-called anti-incretins, and this balance is disturbed because of this um, um, hypermetabolic state that occurs. So it's a primarily the Westerners' diets, lifestyles, of course there's a genetic background, and in, we know that the Indian population has got certain genes which make it more prone for this. Then you get the insulin resistance this syndrome, and this Actually, the name of metabolic syndrome should be changed to insulin resistance syndrome. And then you have the various disorders, type 2 diabetes, then you have, of course, NASH, uh, PCOS, and so many other diseases that are consequence of this. So this is the central mechanism, and the consequence comes this. This is, again, very interesting now because the duodenum is the center of all this. What are the studies? In fact, 50 top laboratories in Europe and uh, U.S., which are, are studying the neuroendocrine mechanisms of the duodenum now, and I think the next few years the Nobel Prize would be from that area. They have extremely well studied how variety of hormones are produced, and there is evidence now this is insulin resistant factor. They're trying to identify what this peptide is, but this insulin resistant factor acts on the glucose pathways in the cell, giving rise to insulin resistance, and the variety of these have been very clearly identified. So there's a huge amount of research. There's other research also to support this. For example, if you take biopsies from the duodenum from normal people and those who have type 2 diabetes or metabolic syndromes, you'll find a markedly increased neuroendocrine cells. Similarly, if you take rats and feed them the Western chow, Western diet, they develop a typical features in the duodenum of this markedly increased neuroendocrine cells producing insulin resistance factor. So the huge amount of experimental evidence to support that. So in other words, if you're treating these patients with insulin resistance or metabolic disease, it's like treating patients with NF. So treatment is same for NFLD and for metabolic syndrome. And again, I'll show you there are a variety of treatments that are now available. Diet, exercise, drugs, and of course, surgery. Exercise is something that we've been, uh, I think, very clearly shown that exercise, um, through its mechanisms of decrease of weight, but also through other mechanisms, actually has a very positive impact on decreasing the insulin resistance and increasing insulin sensitivity. That is well known. Uh, diet is more interesting because there's now a lot of uh, noise about diet that's coming in. Um, what is now becoming more and more obvious in the literature is that the so-called change in the food type the, or the quantity of diet, the Atkins diets and so on, are not very useful on long-term basis. Some short-term benefits, but long-term they are more. The time-restricted diet, which commonly is called intermittent fasting, is becoming much more commonly used because it's easier to follow, and therefore the so-called time-restricted diets are now becoming very popular. In fact, way back, this was a very important paper in 1997 published in New England Journal of Medicine, we showed that um, calorie restriction uh, in rats resulted in prolonging the life of these rats. So we restrict the calorie. But the problem is calorie restriction is a very difficult thing to follow for humans because of so many other things that are coming in. So when rats were forced, it's okay, but not in human beings. So the alternative is concentrate on the type of food and the type of feeding. There's again a lot of uh, articles in gastroenterology. For example, American Journal of Gastroenterology, whole issue was food as a medicine how we can use food as a medicine. And this uh, Mediterranean diet has become more and more commonly used. In fact, uh, we did a very interesting study uh, in our institute recently where our hospital kitchen made the typical Mediterranean diet in conjunction with an Israeli company. And then we divided our residents into two groups, those 
uh, were given normal diet and one group was given Mediterranean diet for a period of three months. And those who took the Mediterranean diet had a dramatic decrease in their um, lipid profile, weights, and also the fats in the liver. The whole metabolic process was called. Again, this is not so easy to follow because cooking Mediterranean diets in a house are not so easy. So this is now uh, regarded as one of the best diets. And but more important now is increasing the gut microbiome role in these patients, increasing evidence that certain types of microbiome can actually produce alcohol in the small intestine and produce liver disease like alcoholic liver disease. But the patient is not taking alcohol. So we call it non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, but actually the bacteria are producing the alcohol. So it's called the auto-brewery syndrome, where sometimes patients even have got intoxicated and we look at the blood levels, they have a high alcohol. But they're not taking alcohol. It's just that it's the microbes in their gut which is producing the alcohol. So this is again becoming very, very important based upon the diet now. For example, we know that when you eat a heavy lunch, you want to go and sleep, you feel drowsy. We feel that's because the stomach is getting all the blood supply, the brain is. That's not the case. The reason for that is the certain amount of substances which microbes are producing in the gut, which are going into the brain, producing intoxication. So these concepts are coming in. So coming back to the intermittent fasting, I think this has now become an important component of treating these patients with metabolic syndrome. For example, uh, you know the window period, uh, there are two types of intermittent fasting. A daily fasting, at 16 hours of fasting, 8 hours of food, or in the ratio of 5 is to do. 5 days you eat and 2 days you do, or alternate days. So the variety of things are there. Again, I won't go too much into this. Uh, but what happens with intermittent fasting is a metabolic switch. Liver-based glucose burning is going to adipose-based burning, and you can see it very clearly how fats from ketones are getting burnt rather than the carbs. So this is, and uh, the effect is there. You can see it in all the organs, including a decrease in the, an increase in the antioxidants that's occurring in these people. So there is a very nice review in New England Journal that I'll recommend you to read uh, recently. So intermittent fasting includes all aspects of metabolic syndrome, including the fatty liver, including A1C. But there are several hurdles. You know, as Indians, we are used to this three times a meal, morning, afternoon, evening. Very difficult to go into intermittent fasting. So although exercise and intermittent fasting or diet is supposed to be helpful, it's not possible in all these patients. So we come to drugs as the next effect. And uh, recently, Dr. Rashish Kumar in Varanasi gave a brilliant lecture on this. So I borrowed this, some of the slides from him. Uh, th this is the new drugs that are coming, GLP-1 agonists, GLT-2 inhibitors, and PIPA. So let me just talk a little on this because as physicians, I know your interest would be on this. GLP-1 agonists, for example, uh, they are, I think, now coming into the market in a big way. They have several positive effects on the metabolic syndrome, including a decrease in hepatic insulin resistance. This becomes a very important factor, decreased hepatic uh, deposition of fat. Uh, of all this, a lot of noise and semaglutide, which is now available in oral form in our country. Uh, of course, oral form is not recommended for NFLD in, by FDA, but we are using it in our country now. It, this is the injectable form, which New England Journal article very clearly showed its efficacy in decreasing steatosis in these patients and also decreasing uh, the inflammation. Of course, the fibrosis does not come down. The cost is considerable. This is a tablet available in our country. It can cost is about 260 rupees per tablet. So it's considerable, but probably people who develop the metabolic syndrome, many of them can really afford this tablet. So this is one. Uh, so this is the guidelines, even in our American Journal of Gastroenterology, which recommends this as the most effective may way of decreasing the body weight. The other drugs are GLT-2 inhibitors. Again, I don't have to tell this audience the various mechanisms in the kidney, in, in the intestines. But I think there is increasing evidence uh, that these can also be used in this situation. Uh, most important is they've been you know, shown to reduce fibrosis in the liver. This is one of the few drugs shown to reduce fibrosis in the liver. There are risks and benefits that you must actually look at before prescribing these drugs. And finally, we have PPAR agonists, of which I think India is proud to have actually uh, been first to evaluate and uh, publish articles on this. They're shown to be very clearly uh, given as a four milligram single day tablet has shown to definitely decrease uh, the thing. And again, this is Ash's work, which has shown clearly how useful it is in these patients. And even in our institute, we have done a, actually a blinded study where we've shown that uh, PPAR agonists are very helpful in this group of patients. But look at this. There's so many drugs coming into NASH that it's a big graveyard 
So drugs are not our answer. Drugs is partly our answer. Diet is partly our answer. Exercise is partly our answer. Do we have something else uh, more? Because if you withdraw the drug, they start gaining weight, start getting back the metabolic syndrome. So the answer seems to be either endoscopy or surgery. We know from several experiments, and this is a very famous experiment I'll show you about. These are spontaneously diabetic mice. Now, in the spontaneously diabetic mice, you put a tube in the duodenum. Uh, one group, a tube is put in. One group, a tube is fenestrations are put in. And when you put in uh, a whole tube without fenestration, the glucose is controlled. But when you put in fenestrations or no, no tube, you see how they are spontaneously diabetic. So that means any food coming in contact with the duodenum is secreting insulin resistance factor, giving rise to the metabolic syndrome. And again shown very clearly in this experiment that if we do a gastrojejunostomy, the food passes both through the jejunum and the duodenum, they continue to have diabetes. But if we do a gastrojejunostomy, cut off the pylorus, then this completely goes off. This was evident even for our bariatric surgeons. When they do a ruin by bariatric surgery, Within a few days, there's a dramatic decrease in the need for insulin. Some of these patients even go into spontaneous hypoglycemia third day, fourth day after surgery without any hypoglycemic. Why does this happen? It can't happen because of the reduced weight. It happens because of a metabolic phenomenon. This was proved recently in this very elegant experiment published in Annals of Surgery by Cummins. So what they did is they did, did a ru and wine bypass surgery for obese patients. And of course, these patients were hyperglycemic. They started feeding because the the food was bypassing the duodenum. It was going directly into the jejunum. Uh, these patients became normoglycemic, right? So this is expected. But look what they did. They put a feeding tube, gave food through the stomach also, and food started passing through the duodenum also. They became hyperglycemic. Just introducing food into the duodenum, they became hyperglycemic. And when they removed this tube and started feeding, they became became normoglycemic very phenomenal experiments to show that it's the food in the duodenum which is stimulating the metabolic syndrome process because of this resistance factor. So this is, I think, now very clear from all this uh, evidence that we have. So how can we, surgery unfortunately can't be done everybody, most people are resistant to it. Can we do it endoscopically? There is some endoscopic evidence that if you put a tube bypassing the dead duodenum going into the jejunum, then you can actually, these tubes came in South America, these are the tubes called endobarriers. And these tubes, I'll quickly go through. The results of this tube showed a control of diabetes, but unfortunately, these tubes had some complications, and therefore, they have been withdrawn. In fact, we created our own tube along with a company in US, and this metamorphic tube was also useful, and uh, some of the results are there. Again, pictures to show how this tube can be very easily put in endoscopically. And this was an example of a patient who actually came from this part of the country who had very severe doctor, who had a very severe type 2 diabetes, not controlled with high dose of insulin. We put in this bypass tube, food was going into the jejunum, and dramatic control of the whole uh, diabetes occurred. But unfortunately, these tubes migrate a lot. They can't be put in for long periods of time because of return. So can we have something more permanent? This more permanent came in terms of these experiments where you can ablate the duodenal mucosa of the rat and then show a very clear response. And this was done in swine, but I'll quickly go to the human experiments in this. There was a very interesting, uh, what is called the duodenal mucosal resurfacing, where you can put an endoscope inside, quickly ablate the duodenum using hot water, hot water in a balloon. Once you inflate the duodenum, the new mucosa that comes does not contain these neurohormonal cells, and therefore these pa patients respond in terms of decreasing uh, their A1Cs and all. And then again, these are some early results that are coming from this area. See, the duodenum is burned, but retains normal mucosa, and all the neuroendocrine cells go. There are a lot of studies for this duodenal mucosal resurfacing, very exciting studies that are coming in, showing effect in diabetes, affecting in, uh, in fact, INSPIRE study showed that these patients can be taken off insulin completely once you do this procedure, NASH and so on. Again, glycemic, you can see A1C is improved dramatically, ALT improves. Uh, th and then what is important is the whole metabolic process seems to improve in these cases. Uh, again, I don't want to go too much into these results, but there is sufficient evidence here that glycemia is reduced, hepatic indices are reduced, insulin sensitivity is increased, and all the metabolic parameters are improved by this. So again, I said insulin, you can actually take them off insulin after doing this procedure. Uh, newer techniques are coming. Again, a paste is coming which can be given in the duodenum, which decreases absorption. But I think the problem is um, 
But this is a big challenge for us, especially for physicians type 2 diabetes. We don't have adequate drugs for this. So the, any of these new procedures are very encouraging. So if I, if I had to conclude, I'd say that the metabolic role of duodenum in causing insulin resistance is very clear here. Uh, I think we have now physiological role that it plays in signaling. We also know that there's evidence that hypertrophic hyperplasia occurs in some of this population and this signal we can cut off and therefore reverse the metabolic syndrome. So the answer for the metabolic syndrome now seems to be a simple endoscope. So I think Murugnathan actually started his career with endoscopy, being a physician. So I think maybe it's a lesson for many that just many of you should start thinking of learning upper G endoscopy so that we can reverse this whole syndrome and coming back to normality. Thank you very much for your attention.